God can restore everything that you've lost. He can restore your lost years. Joseph, at 17, was, was thrown into the pit. He spent the first two years in prison, from the pit to the prison. The next 11 years with Potiphar. And then at 30, because of this relationship with Potiphar, by the time he's 40, he's the second wealthiest man in the world and the second most powerful man in the world. Some people would think, well, I've lost 13 years. But Joseph never thought that because he, he had a God-sized dream. See, he didn't focus on what he had lost. He focused on what he was, God was moving him to. God can restore everything that you have lost. Jim and Leanne are here today from Beacon Hill Baptist Church. They had been through a very difficult time, a church that was planted by the First Baptist Church of, of Somerset, uh, Kentucky in 1965 right there on Highway 27 an incredible location for a church uh, and it's experienced incredible growth they went through as Jim and Leanne would share with you they went through a very difficult period it just kind of came out of the blue just like difficult periods do and really the period extended couple of years, even a couple of years before I got there. And the period got so difficult in that church in the summer before I got there in January that almost a hundred people or so had, had left the church. And the budget had been dropped from a million dollars a year to $600,000 a year by the time I got there. Because these hundred, these hundred people, not only lost a hundred people out of worship, but you lost $400,000 in gifts and offerings and financial resources. I remember there was a, a, there was a person there that several people as I came in and as I talked, uh, several people said, gosh, Dr. Taylor, we've lost so much at Beacon Hill, I'm not sure that we can ever get back to where we were. There has been so much that's lost. Some of my, my best friends are gone. They've gone to other churches. And I don't believe that we'll have enough resources to be able to pay our staff and to pay our bills. And one person would have focused totally on what had been lost, which was massive. Uh, in this period of time, and particularly the summer before I came. But there was another person that said, when I got there, they said, let's just, let's get back on track. Let's get back, let's get back to the business of loving people and loving God. That was their theme, and serving the Lord. And let's just get our eyes on Jesus, and let's get our focus on Him. And let's don't be focused on what we've lost. Let's be focused on the dream that God gave Beacon Hill Baptist Church to be formed and to be the body of Christ. Because God will restore always in your life. And God will restore always in your church everything that you have lost when you get your eyes and your focus on Him. Amen? And so what I want to tell you today, that beginning in 2014, the church began to come together through a period of two or three years of a very difficult time. And one worship service after another worship service after another worship service. And I want to tell you that what had been lost in three years had been reclaimed back within six months. And that the hundred, that, uh, the hundred folks that had been lost over the conflict, the, the gain now was the, we gained back the hundred that were lost, and then we added a hundred to it. Amen? 
And the budget no longer was 600000 It had moved to $1.1 million because it was larger than it was before. And on some Sundays there at Beacon Hill, we received offerings right at $100,000. Amen? Because God restored. He restored back everything that had been lost. How many of you think God's capable of doing that? Raise your hand. He can restore back everything that was lost. When we don't focus on what has been lost, but what the dream is. And that's why we're always dreaming. And the same, Joseph's life is a perfect example. That's why there's 13 chapters in Genesis dedicated to it. Because it's a life that we can all relate to. Because we know what it's like to experience loss. But we don't think about what we've lost. We don't dwell. He never complained one time. We focus on what God is getting ready to do because greater is always coming ahead. Amen? By the time he's 40 years old, he's the second wealthiest man in the world and the second most powerful man in the world with two incredible sons, a beautiful wife. And it wasn't loss at all. It was part of God's plan. And the same for Beacon Hill as it's continued to be healthy and continues to grow and to move forward. So the story goes this way as we're looking at the life of Joseph. So there's much to be, there's much to be, to learn. He, it was he and his brothers, he's the youngest, he's his dad's favorite. We talked about last week. But this dreamer, with this goofy coat makes him so mad. He just irritates him so much. And the fact that his, it's his, the dad's favorite, the youngest son, is so irritating. And so in the passage today, his dad sends him off just to, he was a tattletale on his brother anyway, Joseph was, and he's, he's gonna have to overcome in the pit uh, how to quit doing that and to break his own pride and and he had this tendency uh, he had this tendency to always put other people down to make himself look better especially his brothers and anything he saw wrong in them he came back and he tattled to his dad which created a real anger in those brothers so his dad sends him out to check on his brothers maybe maybe his dad's wanting reconciliation in the family but when they, the Bible says in the passage we just read, when they see him coming, which means they see his what? They see that coat of multicolors. And when they see that coat, their jugular vein pooches out. And they just instantly are ticked off. You probably have people in your life that when you see them coming, you get, oh well, let's just move on. And so... Uh, and they get just ticked off. And they get angry because he flaunts this coat. And he flaunts the fact that he's his dad's, dad's favorite. And so these brothers, with a mob mentality, decide according to the scripture that's been read today that they're, they're going to kill their brother. But one of the brothers decides, well, let's just don't kill him. Let's throw him in a what? Let's throw him in a pit. And it's kind of a passive-aggressive strategy to maybe to save his life. And so what happens is in a pit that's been dug in rock as a cistern to, to save water in the desert where water is a high commodity, they throw young Joseph into a pit, a pit that's about four feet wide and about 12 to 15 feet deep. And so when he hits the bottom, it's a hard thud. And when he rises to his feet, if he does, he's bleeding pretty profusely. And can you imagine, could you imagine Joseph at the bottom of that pit 
looking up to 22 eyes. All his brothers peering down into that pit. And so the story goes, the story goes. What an incredible journey from the pit to the prison. And then eventually to the palace. Maybe that's why there's 13 chapters in Genesis that's designated uh, to this person's life. Maybe it's because all of us can identify with if we're going to always be dreaming, we're going to have to run through the mud sometimes. And that it's what we do in the pit that will determine our destiny. And so can you imagine those brothers that take and take the coat back to their dad and this is another incredible part of the story as they, as they share with their dad that he has been killed and here's the coat and here's the blood. And even though those 11 brothers knew that it was a lie to, con- to be able to continue to tell this lie to their dad and to try to console him in his grief, not for one year or two years, but for 22 years, So as we think about, as we think about this story, as we think about all that is there, we know what pits are. Sometimes we get pushed into them. Sometimes we choose to go in there in a fallen world. Sometimes it just happens. But the question today is, are we going to pass the pit test? Because Joseph had to pass these tests. He had to pass the pride test. And he has to pass the pit test. Pits in our lives are products of a fallen world. Jesus said himself, in this world you will have trouble. But in difficult times for all of us, it's much easier to blame others than it is to take a hard look at ourselves. But Joseph was at able to pass the pit test when he was able to be broken and developed a humble spirit rather than an arrogant egotistical spirit he was just doing what his father wanted to do but out of jealousy and hate calls us sometimes to do very hurtful things And so they saw, certainly saw him from afar off. And they felt like that he was showing off again. And they did something that was pretty regrettable. Some things that I want to mention today for your life and for this church. And as we think about Beacon Hill's uh, situation and the period they went through and as well as First Baptist Church of London that God is with us from the dream to the pit and from the prison to the palace and that we don't have a testimony if we don't pass the test and that we pass the test and we can chase the dream And that all we need for all of the years to be restored is two things. God's favor and a God-sized dream. Amen? That's all we need is God's favor and a God-sized dream. Because that dream is an inner flame. But one thing cannot happen. One thing cannot happen is we can never be comfortable in the pit. Because pit dwellers focus on what they're going through. Dreamers focus on what they're going to. Let me say that one time, one another time. Pit dreamers, they focus on what they're going through. And dreamers always focus on what they're going to. I would remind you that what threatens to destroy you will always be the source that delivers you. And that it is a great day when First Baptist Church of London passes the test. Because that's a promotion day. 
that God promotes us into a broader, more incredible future that fulfills his dreams. And so I want to encourage you today, every person here, if you are focused on what you've lost, you're not getting the full picture of what God can do when we're always dreaming. Because after Joseph began to walk in humility, everything began to unfold for him that God had planned. You could say, well, he lost 13 years. But looking back at it, it so fit into God's plan. You could say about the Beacon Hill Baptist Church in Somerset, Kentucky, for a two-year period or so there, they lost their focus in terms of being the body of Christ. But then looking back on it now, he restored all that was lost. And now it's a stronger, stronger, more vibrant, more faithful church than it's ever been. Now what we know about lost years as we close is those are fruitless years. We ask the question when we feel like we've lost, and whether it be lost health or lost relationships, I want you to understand that God will restore everything that you've lost the lost years seem fruitless. We ask the question, what has come of all my time and effort? Is this all that there is? Is this all that I'm going to get out of this? When we focus on the lostness, we kill the dream. Lost years and lost things and lost resources, those are painful years. We have to find a way to live with disappointment because it's not meeting our expectation. And can you imagine Joseph, this, this man of many dreams? Could you imagine this young man at 17 in the bottom of this pit? He had no idea what was to happen next, but within a very, very short period of time, he's on the back, he's on the back of a camel being sold, being sold. Uh, to traitors as a slave. Lost years are selfish years. When we focus on what we have lost as a church, and when we focus on what we've, we've lost in our lives and what we haven't done, and we live in a state of reg regret, we start saying things, I've wasted all of these years. And we feel stuck. But I want you to be encouraged today that God's plan and God's pattern, uh, we find it in the Old Testament and beyond, that God will restore lost years. In the Old Testament, it says for four consecutive years, the harvest was completely wiped out. But he said that God in the coming years, their fields would yield an abundance that would make up for everything that had been lost. Do you believe that, church? that God will restore everything that has been lost. Many times during those loveless years, we say to ourselves, I wish I could have loved like that. I wish I could have loved more. And we focused on what we haven't done and what we've lost. In those lost years, we focus on rebellious years. We, rebellion brings much pain in our families and into our lives. And it develops in us a sense of regret. Decisions that we've made that we shouldn't have made. That do nothing but kill the dream that God has for us. Many focus, many focus in these lost years and this lostness and focus on what they've lost on missed opportunities. I've had many, many people say to me in their olding, older years, they would say, gosh, if I'd only chosen a different path, if I'd only have done in the 20s what I felt like that I needed to do, if only I would have taken, I would have taken the path that was least traveled rather than most traveled, if only I would have, I would have taken the path that that I felt like in my heart that I needed to do rather than what was safe and easy. 
And for 50 years, I've lived in, lived in a state of regret that I've always taken the easy way and that I've never taken God's way. I want to bring you encouragement today from the example of Joseph that God can restore everything that you've lost. Some of you that came to faith later in your years of accepting Jesus, you beat yourself up sometimes because you say, I wish I would have I'll become a believer earlier in my life. But we cannot focus on what we weren't. We focus on who we are and what we need to focus to. And so as we finish up today, how can God restore the lost years as he did in Joseph's life, as he did at Beacon Hill Baptist Church, as he will do at First Baptist Church, London, Kentucky. Amen? He will restore everything that's been lost. And so the way he does that, he lets the loss of these years make our love for Jesus greater and greater, not less and less. And as our love for Jesus grows more and more, the lostness goes away and we see how that everything that we have gone through is part of God's plan to make us who we are today so I challenge you today in the name of Jesus that if your focus is on just what you have lost to love Jesus more and more to make him the center of your life to surrender everything that you have to him and he will make life abundant and he will take away all the regret. He will take away the things that you think are missing in your life. He will take away those decisions that, that you feel like have kept you from doing what God's called you to do. And he will bring a new vitality and abundance. And we won't, we won't be focused on what is lost, but what is gained. That's how God restores lost years. That's how God restores lost opportunities. That's how God restores lost promises. It's when we make Christ the main thing. God restores lost years by multiplying your fruitfulness. And that's one of the things that I saw at Beacon Hill. And we're trusting God to see here at First Baptist Church London is that he takes our efforts and he uses them in greater ways. And we're able to do, as the body of Christ, more than what we could ever imagine or think. And things that weren't together come together. And things that we were fall, fall, were falling apart are falling in place. And that he begins working day in, day out to build us into a unit, unit to advance the kingdom that we never dreamed or imagined that he could do. And then we look about the struggle and we look about the difficulty and it makes perfect sense why it happened. And our focus is never then on what we lost, but what we're gaining now. And we realize that we had to go through to get to where God wants us to be. Amen? He takes, God will restore everything that has been lost. God will restore lost years. God restores lost years by bringing long-term gain from short-term loss. The Bible says in the Old Testament, I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. I will restore the years the locusts have eaten. But as we conclude, Joseph had to fight against the lies of the enemy. And so we must have to fight against the lies of the enemy if we'll ever get out, if we ever get out of the pit. We cannot be comfortable in the pit, even though we're moving to the prison, and then tonight we're going to talk about moving to the palace. Because we know God is faithful. We know his words are true. That what be God begins, he will always finish. He never gives up. But when we're in the pit, the enemy will try to get us to focus on our circumstances rather than on God's faithfulness. He will fabricate evidence to support his lies. And just in the same way, Joseph's brothers, they created false evidence, alternative facts. For 22 years, Jacob believed his son was dead. 
And the brothers heard their father cry himself to sleep for 22 years because Jacob believed his son, his favorite son, was dead. They never one time in 22 years went to him with the truth. But, and we will suffer unnecessary grief if we allow the lies in the pit to determine what we believe. If we want to get out of the pit, we will have to discern the lies of the enemy because in the pit we're always vulnerable. We're weak. Satan's biggest lie when you're in the pit and you might, have found, you might find yourself there even as I speak is that you've messed up too badly. It's too late for you. I've had young people in their early and mid-20s saying, it's too late, I will never change. Think about that. People in their 20s saying, I've done too much wrong. My, my life can never change. Couples experiencing divorce in their early 30s and say, gosh, my life is a failure. It's a mess. I can never recover. Because when we're in the pit, we're in the pit, we focus on what we don't have. We lose sight of the dream. That's why I want you to remember today as we think about God restoring everything that's been lost this particular day that we're always to continue uh, to dream. So Joseph had to fight against the lies of the enemy. But I want you to understand that you can never say, regardless of your age, and I know that we have people in this room, many people in this room that are in their 90s, it is never too late for you. Wherever you've been and whatever you've done, God can restore whatever is missing in your life. Because the Bible is an entirely a book of restoration about people like me and you that have messed up so badly that it seemed even God couldn't do anything about it, yet He restored every one of them. As long as you have breath in your body, it is never too late to call out to God. And it doesn't matter what pit you're in, call out to God because He can fix it. So as I conclude, I would just say, that bitterness will keep you in the pit. Forgiveness will move you to the palace. And we see in Joseph's life that he never complained, he never whined, he never said, woe is me, because he was always dreaming. Let's pray. Father God, as we close our service today, maybe there's someone here today that sees their life in the pit hopeless, without direction, no dream, no direction. I pray, Lord, that that person right now would just imagine a ladder, a ladder being set down into the very bottom of that pit and Jesus making his way down into that pit to rescue He makes his way into the pit, but we have to invite him down. We have to want him there. We have to believe that he is able to rescue us and restore us from any life experience that we've had. The Bible says that Jesus says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. I want to bring the ladder down. I want to come down to you at the very bottom, but you're going to have to invite me down. You're going to have to let me come in. The hardest decision in the world that I have ever made is to surrender my life to Christ. Probably the hardest decision many people in this room have ever made is to say, Lord, this isn't my life. It's yours to live through me. There's just something about that with pride that kicks in that makes it so very difficult 
when it moves from being all about us to all about Him. But I think there are many people in this room, me included, that would say that was the very best decision that we ever met, that we ever made. Because it wasn't until Jesus brought that ladder down into the pit that we really have experienced abundant life. And what we thought we were losing in yielding our life to Jesus has actually been the biggest blessing ever. Because instantly when we surrendered our life to Him, He filled our hearts. And He filled us with who He was. And no longer were we empty. No longer did we have, no, no longer did we lack direction. No longer did we worry any more about what happens to us when we die. And even, it, even though it was the most deci difficult decision, it was the greatest decision of our lives. Whosoever will call on the name of the Lord shall be saved. For God so loved the world that He gave His only Son, that whosoever believes in Him shall not perish, but have everlasting life. In Jesus' name I pray, and everyone said, Amen. Would you stand?